like applause before I talk, because it means my job is done, so thank you. Um, and I'm excited to, to talk to you all today. I'm really excited about Dave's program. I think it's really um, innovative and progressive, and so I'm, I'm happy to have some small part in it. Um, and so I'm happy to talk to you guys today. I, um, a couple of things, if those of you who have me in class now or have had me ever, when I get excited, I begin to talk more and more rapidly. And, and so you may lose, I might lose you. So please feel free to flag me down if that's the case. Um, additionally, uh, if you have questions as we go along, I'm happy to make this a conversation and a discussion. There's no need for, for me to lecture it to you guys, all right? So please um, feel, free to, feel free to ask questions. Sound good? OK. So um, this title is kind of ambitious, and there's really no way I can talk about all of the things and how climate and nitrogen are related. Um, I, it, that would be really more than a life's work um, to do that, I think. And so there's multiple ways we could approach this. And what I'm going to do is give you a little bit of a background about why we care about nitrogen, why it's important, and how humans have altered the cycle of nitrogen. And then we're going to switch, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the research we do in my lab, specifically focused on nitrogen, and looking specifically at how climate change has altered the nitrogen cycle in a coastal estuary just a little bit south of here. Sound good? OK. So how many of you have seen this plot? This is a CO2 curve from Mount Aloha over time. OK, excellent. That's pretty good. Surprisingly, when I give the, I think surprisingly, when I give this talk, many people don't raise their hands, OK? And that, that's interesting. And we know here that what we're looking at right, is the breathing of the Earth. And if we look just since this has been started, there's been a clear increase. We can go back even further past the record from Mount Aloha and use ice cores to see a much longer record and a much bigger change in the carbon dioxide concentrations over the last couple hundred years. In fact, if we look at this, it's about a 40% increase. And I'm not going to argue, neither should you, that that's not important. It absolutely is. A 40% increase in our concentration of atmospheric CO2 is, a, is an amazing change and one that's occurred really rapidly. But what I want to argue today for you to think about um, is what we've done to the nitrogen cycle. And so I'm going to take the next few minutes to tell you about how we really drastically alter the nitrogen cycle, so much so it would put this graph to shame. So the thing we need to realize first is that nitrogen is essential for life. So these are this picture of a phytoplankton. Phytoplankton you can think of as a microscopic grass of the sea. Um, it is the foundation of all food webs in the ocean. You got to have nitrogen if you want to make phytoplankton. If you want to make krill, right, these delicious little nuggets that support much bigger food webs, you have to have phytoplankton, and such you have to have nitrogen. And even for this krill, for his DNA and everything that's inside of him, you also need nitrogen. And if you really just care about whales, well, that's wonderful, but you can't have nitrogen without krill. And I mean, whales without nitrogen, because you can't have them without krill, and you can't have them without phytoplankton. And there's a whole bunch of nitrogen in this beast here. All right, there's nitrogen in its proteins, and in its DNA, and RNA, et cetera. And then, of course, as humans, I don't know why I picked Russell Crowe, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> He's a new water movie coming out about water. It looks good, anyhow. So um, I chose him, and we are full of nitrogen. About 3% of your body by weight is nitrogen. OK, so it's, in, it's important fundamentally for everything that we do, from proteins to how our eyes work, 3%. Okay. Yep. And I know nitrogen fertilizer makes grass green, but why does why is nitrogen important for that final point? That was a starting point. That's a starting point. So hold on, I'm going to tell you right now. Okay. And just like that, it's basically the same idea for the grass and your and your and your vegetables. It's the same idea for phytoplankton. OK, so I want to get a couple of terms down because um, there's some lingo you need to commit to memory for you to be able to talk nitrogen, all right? And the first one is something that's called biologically usable nitrogen. And we're going to compare that to biologically unusable. Typically, when you're dealing with nitrogen and what it does to ecosystems, we talk about them in terms of reactive nitrogen, also known as NR, or unreactive nitrogen. The forms of reactive nitrogen are things like dissolved inorganic nitrogen, ammonium, nitrite, and nitrate. All right? These are all fundamentally important for, um, for growing everything we're talking about, like phytoplankton or grass or whatever it is. Okay? And next to them, so you see them in grass and in whales and in people. Next to that, we have N2 gas, or dinitrogen gas. And that is what makes up most of our atmosphere. In fact, about 80% of our atmosphere, so about 80% of what you're breathing today, is N2 gas, or dinitrogen. 
in most cases, organisms can't use this form. We can only use this form. So plants have to take this fo one of these forms up, and then we eat the plant, or we eat a deer or a cow or whatever that made the plant, and that's how we get this nitrogen. This form of unreacted nitrogen is literally unreactive for 99% of the organisms on Earth. But just to confuse you, there are some that can use it. And I spend an enormous amount of time thinking about them, and that is a story for another day. These are things that fix nitrogen, OK? So they take N2 and go through a, a process and make it into dissolved organic nitrogen or ultimately into ammonium. So even though all right, this can be reactive for some organisms, for most, for 99% of organisms on Earth, they can't use N2. Are you with me? Because that gets kind of, so it's annoying that they call it unreactive nitrogen, because in fact it is reactive. It's just a small pool that can use it. All right? So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about this process today. But so far, so good. OK. So like Lawford was asking about, why do we need the nitrogen? Well, we need the nitrogen to grow things like corn, if you want to grow corn and eat things. OK? And we need to grow phytoplankton. And this is where we need to think about a term called Liebig's Law of the Minimum. This is a really interesting story. The history of nitrogen is really interesting and has a lot of social things to it. I'm teaching a course this um, spring in the Killich on Honors course, or a series, if any of you guys are in that program, about the history of nitrogen and social contracts and what we've done to it, if you're interested. I'm doing that plug because I want to have people in the class. OK. So this is the idea. Long ago, not that long ago, this man, Van Liebig, came up with an idea. Um, and he called it the Liebig's Law of the Minimum. And the idea was based on how to grow crops. And it was interesting because we were having a big boom of population. And there was lots of fear that we weren't going to have enough crops around. And land was going to run out of food. And people were going to starve to death. And we won't go any further into it than that. So Liebig was trying to figure out, well, how do you get the most out of your land? And he said, well, you could fertilize it. Because there's going to be something that's limiting. There's going to be something that will make sure there's not a huge amount of nitro uh, crops that's produced. So this is called Liebig's Law of the Minimum. And one way to think about it is it's a, it's a factor that limits biological activity. So here in this, um, in this bucket, we have all these different things that you might need to grow corn, right? You have something like light and water and phosphorus or potassium, OK? And over here, you have nitrogen. And what you see is that the slat of, from that bucket is lowest on the nitrogen. So this bucket of, of water can only hold as much water as as tall as, as, as like the little slit, slit here of wood for nitrogen is tall. Instead of putting water in here, you could put crops in here. And you could say you could only grow as much crop as you possibly can until you run out of nitrogen. So Liebig's Law of the Minimum applies to all systems, whether you're in freshwater or marine systems or on land. And it turns out that in general, and there's complicating factors for this, but in general, nitrogen is the limiting nutrient for production on land and in the ocean. And phosphorus is the limiting nutrient in freshwater. OK, so if you want to grow a lot of crops, you got to add some nitrogen. If you want to grow a lot of phytoplankton, you have to add some nitrogen. So far, so good? OK. Do you all Why is it different from fresh water? That's a great and super complicated question. <laughs> um, so can we hold off on that and, and just, yeah. just, yeah, that's like a whole other I'll series. Hall, yeah, small. and we can talk about it right at, when, I, when I'm done. We probably have <laughs> excess time. We can talk about it. OK? So if we look then, and, and we take Lee Big Sting a little bit as a step further, we're trying to grow more crops. And so I'm trying to remember compare this nitrogen to CO2. And so what we're looking at here is the amount of nitrogen fertilizer that's been produced since the 1950s. And you can see it has a similar type of curve shape to that CO2 curve. All right? And the reason is because we had to grow a lot of crops so that we could support a lot of population, our 7 billion people population that we have today. So let's take a look at the nitrogen budget before humans intervened, OK? So in 1860, we had cultivation. You could cultivate some of those end fixers I talked about, like peanuts or, or clover or soybeans or something like that, all right? And that added about 15 teragrams of nitrogen. We had fossil fuel combustion, but just a little bit of it, and that can add nitrogen. And then the Haber-Bosch process. The Haber-Bosch process is the process that fixes N2 gas out of the atmosphere and turns it into fertilizer and allows us to produce all of that fertilizer. We didn't invent that until the early 1900s, so it's a zero here. Um, it turns out that lightning can also add a little bit of nitrogen, but I'm ignoring it in this, in this budget here. Okay. 
So in 1860, we had uh, humans were adding to the system about 15 teragrams of nitrogen per year. If we fast forward to 2000, we now cultivate almost twice more, just over twice as many crops that fix nitrogen. We burn way more fossil fuels than we did then. And we have a huge amount of nitrogen that we add in the system because we make fertilizer with the Haber-Bosch process. So we went from 15 teragrams of nitrogen to 165 teragrams of nitrogen. So do you all remember the percentage of CO2 that has increased? Well, how high is that percentage? 40%, right? Do you know how high this one is? Higher or lower than 40%? percent mm hmm It's about 1,000%. And in fact, every time I write that number, I get nervous and have to check it again. But the percent change between 15 and 165 over this time period is a 1,000% increase in the amount of nitrogen that humans have added to the system that's cycling through the biosphere. So CO2 is important, and boy, we've altered it. But wow, what about nitrogen? We've really altered the amount of nitrogen. This is not totally a bad thing. And in fact, if we do the math, and this is kind of a, a yucky plot here, but what I want you to pay attention to is world population. And then you see the um, average fertilizer input is here, this little this blue line right here. And what's important is that over this time frame, right, we've been able to increase the human population solely because of this nitrogen that we fix. And in fact, there's about 50% of us are alive, 48%, 50% of us are alive today because of nitrogen that's fixed in the Haber-Bosch process that allows us to grow crops. So how many people are in this room right now? I don't know, 30? Is that generous? 15 of us would have to go. See you later. You're dead. You were never even born, okay, because of this process. So can we agree that nitrogen's, nitrogen's important? Have I sold you on that a little bit? You're like, yeah, no, I'm just going to nod. Please keep going. Okay. But like anything that we add, have in systems, when you add too much nitrogen, you lead to a series of, of negative consequences. One of the largest ones has been something that falls under the phrase of eutrophication, which is called it's an increase in the amount of organic matter to a system. We can do that in a variety of ways. But typically in our coastal systems, eutrophication is driven by excess nitrogen. Here's a beautiful plot of a phytoplankton bloom. Right? Do you guys want to swim in that water? Nope. Do you want to eat anything in that water? No, I don't blame you. This is from McCoy Bay, which is just on the Cape, and we pulled up our anchor. So not only is it a ton of phytoplankton, but you can get a ton of macroalgae too, and that's what we're looking at here. So excess nitrogen, when it makes it into the coastal system, can do bad things. I want to walk you through this a little bit. So here, we're looking at a nice, your nice summer house okay, on the Cape. And it's attached to a septic tank. At least it should be attached to a septic tank. And downstream, you're looking over a beautiful system. And you see the system has eelgrass in it, maybe a little bit of phytoplankton, and lots of oxygen. When you add more nitrogen to the system, either you pack the people full in your house, or you have tons of people living around coastal systems, you increase the amount of reactive nitrogen that enters the system. And then you increase the amount of phytoplankton production that blooms. And in time, those phytoplankton are going to die. And when they do, they fall to the bottom and they decompose. Uh, here we have eelgrass disappearing because the phytoplankton blocks out the light. The phytoplankton fall to the bottom. They decompose. They use up the oxygen. And you have hypoxic, which is low oxygen, or anoxic, which is no oxygen conditions. You heard of the Gulf of Mexico dead zone? That's this, just on a much bigger scale. Okay? So when this happens, you end up with a uh, cascading effect of very bad things. For example, um, after anoxia, where you can increase the algal production, too many nutrients can lead to harmful algal blooms, things that are toxic that can cause things like um, um, making you sick to your stomach, but can also cause neural, neurodegenerative problems. Um, they have low oxygen conditions. You can kill fish, both fin and shellfish. And then you lose biodiversity, and you can lose. Um, it's, it's the death of the, it's when the algal mass die. Mm -hmm. They consume the oxygen. Well, the decomposition process consumes the oxygen. Right. Yep. So there's two ways these can be bad for eelgrass, for example. You can block the light out, or any organism that might need light. You can block the light out by shading it. Or when they die, the bacteria eat them all up. And then when they do that, they consume the oxygen in the water column. All right. So these are all of the bad things. So this is a real, really big dilemma that we're faced with, because we're not going to stop feeding people. At least I hope we're not going to stop feeding people. right? So we need to feed people. Our population's only going to rise. And you have to figure out what we're going to do with this excess nitrogen. 
before I continue on that story, just a quick side effect. Um, all of these processes, burning fossil fuels, uh, making nitrogen fertilizer, low oxygen conditions, all of them can lead to an increase in nitrous oxide. So in red, you see your familiar carbon dioxide. In blue is your methane. And the black line here is nitrous oxide. And nitrous oxide is a greenhouse gas 300 times more powerful than CO2. So when we start to talk about and think about how nitrogen can impact climate, this is a big one, right? We increase nitrous oxide. We're increasing the greenhouse gas that has um, this really high global warming potential. <clears throat> All right, and then the last thing that nitrous oxide can do is it can interact with ozone, and it's right now the number one um, ozone-depleting substance in the environment. So when we burn fossil fuels, when we make fertilizer, when we increase low oxygen conditions, all of these things lead to more nitrous oxide. And all of these things can then warm our, cl warm our planet and then also um, destroy our ozone, which can warm us and also lead to some pretty severe and significant health impacts. So those are all the negatives of nitrogen, all right? the negatives and positives of it. And I want to talk to you now about knowing that information as I did when I started my PhD. I wanted to choose a project that would help us figure this problem out. And I knew that you know, we all basically make small contributions in the hope of making a hope that someone will make a big contribution one day. So my idea was to look at this, look at a process that naturally occurs in environments that can remove nitrogen. Okay? And that process is called denitrification. It takes the biologically reactive form of nitrogen, nitrate, and turns it into N2 gas. And remember, we would call that biologically unreactive because only nitrogen fixers can use it. So when I started graduate school, this was the idea I had. I said, I'm going to study, here's the nitrogen cycle when I started. This is how we how we thought of it. I'm only going to study this process, this process that can remove it. I wanted to do that in a coastal system because coastal systems can remove up to 50% of the human-derived nitrogen entering that system. Denitrification can remove it. So I thought this is good. I'm going to figure out what controls this and this system, and maybe that will be applicable to wider scale systems. Today, we know the nitrogen cycle looks a little bit more like something like this, a little less like a cycle, a little bit more like the Boston subway, right? That's what it reminds me of. All right, and we're not going to go into all of this. I just want you to keep in the back of your mind to know that this idea, probably not so true. This idea, much more realistic. Lots of things are interacting. But we're going to narrow it down today to focus on two. Denitrification, which removes nitrate, okay, and by doing so then would decrease the amount of phytoplankton that could bloom and thus decrease those negative impacts um, by turning nitrate into N2 gas. And we're going to look at end fixation, which is the opposite process. And we're going to look at that because that was a surprise that I found in my work. And so something, one reason why I wanted to talk to you all about this today is because if you, when you go and do research, either, either as your undergraduate career or as graduate students, you're going to find yourself um, with, un with surprising data, hopefully. And, and that will be interesting. It will shape how you look at the world. And it's kind of interesting. Well, I think it's nice when people admit they didn't expect to see something. OK. So I'm really hitting this hard because I want to make sure you know that denitrification removes nitrogen from the system, creates, no, takes nitrate, and turns it into N2. The technique that I use, uh, or that I used for this, um, is called the N2-argon technique. And if you want to know the details about it, we can talk about them later. But it's a uh, mass spec method that measures dissolved concentrations of N2 in the water. Um, the problem with it is it only gives you a net measurement. All right? So if you also have end fixation going on, all right, then you wouldn't know that. You just get the net product of it. It's like getting your bank statement and only just having the end number of what you spent all month long. You don't know whether it went to groceries or to gym sneakers or whatever it was. You only know the, the number out at the end. And then we thought that was OK because this process was supposed to be not important. OK? This is not important. So I thought, that doesn't matter. This is not going to happen. I can use this method. It will only measure. It will give me a net measurement, but it doesn't matter because in the system I'm studying, this doesn't matter. So I chose this, and I went happily off to measure denitrification. The system I worked in is a system just south of here called Narragansett Bay. So here's New York City. Here are we up, we're up in Boston. And we're going to zero in on this square here. Um, so here's the Cape, and now we're talking about Narragansett Bay. 
Narragansett Bay is a fantastic system to work in for many reasons. For one, it has a great north-south gradient. So the city of Providence is here, which means all of the nitrogen that's coming into the bay comes in here. And here we have the ocean. So there's this nice gradient of high nitrogen, and it decreases down bay. Following that, we have high primary production, lots of phytoplankton production up here, because there's lots of nitrogen, and that decreases as you move down bay. But there aren't really big swings in um, salinity, which is helpful. So the salinity here is about 28 parts per thousand, and the salinity here is about 30 or 32 parts per thousand. So we have a big gradient in things like nitrogen and primary production, but a smaller gradient in terms of salinity. So things like microbial processes uh, might not be impacted so much. <clears throat> Remember, I just talked to you um, endlessly here about for a few minutes about how much nitrogen was coming into systems and we were adding all this nitrogen. The other reason that Narragansett Bay is a really interesting place to work is because unlike other estuaries, the amount of nitrogen entering the bay, it went, um, we started adding nitrogen on Thanksgiving Day in 1861. There was a parade. They fired cannons it was because the public works started working and people had sewage. So they celebrated it, and I don't blame them. Um, so we've got really good numbers on that. And we went high, got lots of high nitrogen. And then really beginning in the 1950s, we stopped adding nitrogen to Narragansett Bay. And that's really unusual. And it has to do with um, sort of upgrades in sewage treatment and population moving in and out of the state and around Providence. And so it's like this neat balance. So for somebody that's interested in learning how to remove nitrogen and wants to know how climate change change might be impacting the nitrogen cycle, Narragansett Bay is a really great spot. Because I can look at some long-term records we'll talk about, but I know that it's not going to be driven by the amount of nitrogen that's coming into the bay. Because that's basically stayed the same since the 1950s. Does that part make sense? OK. There have been other big ecosystem changes. For example, the winter flounder um, has totally crashed. And that's not from overfishing alone, because when we stopped fishing, the, pl the flounder population didn't come back. The Tinafore nemeopsius ladii is around way more. It's uh, more abundant. It's around earlier. And it lasts longer in the season. So that's a big change. By far, um, there's two really the much bigger changes. And that has to do with the temperature in Narragansett Bay. And this um, that I'm going to talk about is specific to Narragansett Bay, but this pattern is generally found along the East Coast. And that is that we've had significant warming um, since the period of record in Narragansett Bay over the last 50 years or so. Okay? Um, what you're seeing here, the gray background is from a NOAA buoy in Newport, Rhode Island. So the green is from something called the phytoplankton survey, and blue is a fish trawl survey. In Narragansett Bay, there have been these long-term records that have, people have gone out um, since the 1960s and collected either fish trawls to know abundance and population of fish, or phytoplankton to know how much phytoplankton is there and what the species are. And while they do that, they grab a bucket and they stick a thermometer in it. And they've been doing that weekly since the 1960s. So this is a really nice, robust data set. And if you look at that, like all natural records, right, there's a lot of variation. But the general trend has been a significant incline in the annual, um, de yeah, it's an increase in the annual temperature between 1.3 and 1.5 degrees Celsius over the last 50 years, depending on what record you look at. Um, this is most pronounced in winter, so the warming is most pronounced in winter, but you still see it in the summer. We can take it a step further and look at the natural range of temperature that was normally found in Narragansett Bay. And normally, um, so this is this period of record again, um, it went from about 1 degree C to about 23 degrees C, and that was the range of temperature. Um, since this time period, you can see that we this is up top here is the winter days below 1 degree C. And here are the summer days above 23 degrees C. And what I want you to notice is that this is, these are declining. So the number of winter days colder than 1 have been declining. And the number of summer days above 23 degrees have been um, I don't know, this is declining. And the number of days um, in winter, I mean in summer, that are higher than 23 degrees have been increasing. And in fact, this is a really big, significant change. So we're pushing the temperature range that's normally seen in Narragansett Bay. We're pushing it. We're, we're moving that up. So we have less winter days that are cold, and we have more summer days that are hot. And this is going to have some profound impacts on what's happening to the entire system, including the nitrogen cycle. There's other major climate change things, like a big decrease in wind. I don't show these data, but this is also true throughout Massachusetts. Blue Hill Observatory, not that far from here, has a long-term wind record, and we also see this decline. So we have less light, and we have less wind. Okay. 
You can also, um, I just gave you this less, less win here. Here's our light. I gave you my slide before I gave you my punchline before I said it. So we have a significant decline in, in the winter spring bloom light that happens. Winter spring bloom period is about December to February for this area. And that's when you'd expect to get most of the phytoplankton production. And what you see is a strong and significant decline in the amount of light that's reaching this area over the last um, 40 years or so. We can regress these against each other if we want. So this is chlorophyll, which is a proxy for phytoplankton. Um, it's just the amount of, uh, amount of phytoplankton in the water column versus light. And I want you to see what this makes sense. When you have more light, you have more phytoplankton. When you have less light, you have less phytoplankton. If we're decreasing the amount of light, then overall the system is, is seeing what's going to happen to our phytoplankton populations. Right? Decreasing the amount of light. That means we're going to be decreasing the amount of phytoplankton in the system. Yep? What, how exactly is the decrease in light connected to climate change, if it is at all? Oh, you are perfect. You're so good. <laughs> You're so good, OK? So we don't know the exact reason for this, but what we think is this. And what, what, we, what we know is this, and this is the connection, OK? This is a, a paper by Melrose et al. In, in 2011. What we're looking at here is the number of cloudy days that Narragansett Bay has been receiving um, over the last, well, this is from the 1920s or so up towards 20, well, 2010 or so. And you can see the number of cloudy days has significantly increased over this period. So this is how this works. It turns out that colder winters have more sunny days and warmer winters have more cloudy days. All right, and that has to do, that makes sense. It has to do with the um, evaporation patterns and wind patterns in the system. So if you have, you're warming up your system and you have more cloud cover, right, then you're going to have more cloudy days. And if you're a phytoplankton that needs light and nitrogen to bloom, you got maybe your nitrogen, but you don't have enough light. So instead of being limited by nitrogen, they're beginning to get limited by light. And we know that phytoplankton are really, really susceptible to changes in light um, for models and experiments. And so this isn't surprising that this would change it. The the other thing that's really important is that decrease in wind. So decrease in wind is clearly a climate impact. And if you don't have a well-mixed water column, then you can set up a stratification where the phytoplankton are stuck in the surface waters, but most of the nutrients are below them. They use up those nutrients, and then they get stuck there, and they can no longer feed, and they die. So we have less wind, warmer temperatures, more cloudy days. It's like a bad scenario for phytoplankton. If I take another way of looking at this is to look at chlorophyll again, this proxy for phytoplankton over time. And you can see this is this weekly measurement from a spot at mid Narragansett Bay. And we're looking at a significant decline over the same period. And there's a model you can use where you take chlorophyll and turn it into primary production numbers. And what I just want you to note is that in the 70s, they were getting about 350 grams of carbon. And down here, when I first started this work, they were getting over just 200. So we have a significant decline in phytoplankton production, which really essentially is a significant decline in the amount of food that those sediments have to eat, that the microbes have to eat in the system. It could also go to explaining why the winter flounder haven't been able to come back, because there might not be enough food for them. We can also go back and look at um, sort of previous studies that have happened in the bay. And it's a similar, um, similar de decrease in primary production or decrease in the amount of phytoplankton produced in this system. Or we can look at another spot in the lower bay. And again, we see a significant decline over the last 30 years. So throughout the whole bay, we've got warming temperatures. We have um, less wind, less light, more cloudy days, and overall less phytoplankton production, all right? Less food for organisms in this, in this system them to eat. This is important because denitrification, which is that removal of nitrogen, is a heterotrophic process. That means it needs to eat carbon in order to do that. Right? It needs organic matter. So what's going to happen if a climate-induced shift in the amount of primary production is happening in the system to the nitrogen cycle? And that was the question I wanted to answer. One easy way, first thing we have to know is, OK, so you've got less water column production, less organic matter being produced in the surface waters. But what does that mean to the sediments? Or is that organic matter even getting there? Can you see that change over time? If um, we were oceanographers, right, we would use something called a sediment trap. These are great for blue water work, right? really deep water columns. But in estuaries, these don't work because it's easy to resuspend sediments off the bottom and put them into the water column. So then you might not really be measuring what's falling down, but instead you could be measuring a mixture of what's falling down and what's getting mixed up. Does that make sense? 
Okay. So what we can do is use some really well-known relationships. And one of the best relationships we have is, um, for coastal systems is this strong relationship between primary production and organic matter input and the amount of uh, respiration or nutrient remineralization that occurs in, in, in the sediments. And the, it's, it's, this is, it's real. This is based on all, all, all real system data. And you see that the more carbon you put in the system, the more the system respires. That's kind of obvious, right? But it's really nice that it works like this. So since I can't use sediment trap data, what I set out to do was measure this in Narragansett Bay and see how it's changed, to see if this decrease in phytoplankton, or essentially organic matter and food to the sediments, driven by things like changes in light and temperature and wind speed, would change how much carbon gets remineralized. So we go and collect cores from all over the place. We can do that with a pull core. They look kind of like this. Or we can do it with a box core, which is much bigger, depending on the depth of the system you're looking at. We bring them back to chambers. We have a chamber here in the Earth and Environment Department where we can seal up these sediment cores, and we collect gas samples over time or nutrient samples, and we can measure how much the sediments are breathing, right? How much carbon are they eating, and what are the respir respirative processes they're giving off? So again, this slide, we're just going to focus on this, although we look at all things. We look at greenhouse gases production and, and sediment oxygen demand and nutrients, but this is just what I want to focus on. <clears throat> okay, so here we are in Mid-Narragansett Bay, and this is how we're going to look at a bunch of these plots right now, where N2 is um, going to either be negative if you've got nitrogen fixation and positive if you have denitrification. It was first measured in the system in 1979, then again in 86, and then again in 2005. That was the first year that I measured. And we see that there is a, a small decline here, okay? Now this is probably what we would predict, because if climate change has altered the amount of primary production in the system, it's changed the amount of food that's fallen to the sediments, that can be decomposed and eaten by these microbes. If we've decreased that amount, then they have less to eat, basically, and so you're going to see a lower rate of denitrification. Does that make sense? What do you think, Lawford? I got it. You got it? Okay. Do I have to repeat it? Mm -mm. Oh, you don't have to repeat it. Not yet. Maybe later. Um, OK, so then I went out in 2006, and I measured nitrogen fixation. I never would have expected to measure nitrogen fixation, because remember, I told you that process doesn't happen. OK? Um, so this was a really big surprise, and this is something just important when you do your own research. Sometimes a surprise means you've done something wrong, and sometimes it turns out to be true. And I was fortunate in this case to be something that was true, although I will tell you that this was a, I made all these measurements on a mass spec in a lab at the Marine Biological Lab in Woods Hole, and this was on the mass spec that I set up that my advisor bought. And so his first question was, what did you wire wrong? Uh, but we confirmed it, and it wasn't, and it was okay. But anyhow, it was a, it was a scary moment. So what we see here is that up here, denitrification has removed nitrogen from the bay. It's removed the reactive nitrogen. That's what we wanted to do. In this case, um, the sediments all of a sudden have added nitrogen to the bay. And I won't go through the math, but basically the sediments in that one summer added more nitrogen to Narragansett Bay um, than the sewage treatment plant did. So the sediments went from being this great filter and remover of nitrogen to being a significant source in one summer. That's kind of surprising, right? OK. So then we set out to try to figure out what it is. So we knew we had these changes, but how can we relate the organic matter changes to what we see? The first thing we did was the low-aligned fruit, because remember, denitrification is taking nitrate, NO3, and turning that into N2. And we knew that in the summer, dissolved inorganic nitrogen, which includes nitrate, was really low. So we conducted an experiment. We added a ton of nitrogen to the system, specifically nitrate to sediment cores. And we measured N2, and we could not get it to stop fixing nitrogen. We couldn't get denitrification to increase. All right. So instead, we went back to our nitrogen cycle. This is way busy, but just remember this is denitrification going from nitrate to N2. When we added the nitrate, nothing happened. So we went and looked at this. And this is what fits in perfectly with what we've been talking about. If there's less phytoplankton for the reasons we talked about, like higher temperatures and lower light and less wind, then maybe that is impacting how much um, denitrification can occur, because there's a lower amount of food in the sediment for them to eat. 
So we did this large mesocosm experiment. Um, the mesocosms, we went out on a barge. It was awesome. We went out on a barge in the middle of Narragansett Bay and collected huge amounts of sediments. We brought them back to these mesocosms. We constructed uh, basically a, a large tent over it or housing to make sure that we could mimic the bottom of Narragansett Bay. And the bottom of Narragansett Bay is dark. And so we had to do that. We put paddles in. We mixed it at the same um, frequency of tidal mixing that Narragansett Bay received. And we had nine treatment tanks. And we added spray-dried phytoplankton to these tanks. We added the one treatment, enough it was our best estimate for what the, what the sediments may have gotten in the 1970s before the changes we've observed. And then we gave them half of that, and then three tanks got none. At the end of the season, I went and measured denitrification, or maybe infixation, right? Collected these sediment cores, brought them into the lab, and what I saw was that all of the tanks that got organic matter were denitrifying. It varied, but they were all denitrifying. All of the tanks that got sort of a medium amount of food, um, one was denitrifying, one was then fixing, they didn't know what they were doing, and all of the tanks that were starved were fixing nitrogen. Another way to look at this is by taking the mean of these and looking at the change of, of N2 fluxes versus the amount of carbon added. And you can see that when they're starved, they fix nitrogen. When they're full of when they're fed organic matter, they denitrify. And when they get a medium point, they don't know what they're going to do. And essentially, this line helps us show a tipping point where we could perhaps start to predict when we're going to get denitrification or nitrogen removal and when we're going to have N added to the system. <clears throat> It's not just the total amount of phytoplankton that's changed in Narragansett Bay, but also the timing of it. So typically, winter spring blooms occur, like I said, somewhere between December and February. And then beginning in the 70s and, and, and really changing a ton into the 90s and early 2000s, the timing of that bloom changed. So instead of having it fall between December and February, it began to fall at many different times of the year. So the maximum pr production of phytoplankton, the timing of that shifted. Right? And that has an important implication for how much organic matter reaches the bottom. In the winter, you would think the organic matter is not a lot around, there's not a lot of microbes active, there's not a lot of zooplankton or copepods to eat things, so the phytoplankton can fall into the bottom and sit there until the system warms up, and then it will, it will start, the microbes will start to chew it up. In the summer, though, as that phytoplankton gets eaten, there's lots of things, like zooplankton, to eat it as it falls down. The microbes might be more active. So the amount of organic matter you're getting and the quality of that organic matter could be much lower. So we replicated the experiment. This time we put a door in instead of a little zipper, which was nice. And um, we had to crawl through the other one. It was kind of hell. Um, and we measured it. So we have three different tanks. They all got the same amount of carbon, but they got it at different times. One got it in January, one got it in April, and one got it in June. We went and we measured the N2 fluxes. And can you all predict what's going to happen? Is there going to be any relationship with days since organic matter deposition and N2 flux? What do you think? Someone's got to think something, because I know some of your names, and then I'll call on you. And so you better hope someone offers something. She's scary. <laughs> well, let's think. Okay, if we have all this organic matter, do we think more, you know, if you measure right after organic matter went down, we should have higher denitrification or lower denitrification? What do you think? Lower? I'm failing at my job up here today, guys. OK. So in fact, it's the other way around. So when you add organic matter and then you measure denitrification, it's high because you've given them a big pulse of food to eat. Okay? But over time, as they eat up all that food, then there's less for them to, to eat because they've, they've eaten it. And so what they respire then, the respiration product, is going to be lower. So now we see that it's not just the amount that reaches it, but the timing of that. And if you have a winter spring bloom and you're measuring something you know, right after this phytoplankton mass fell to the bottom, you're going to get more denitrification than versus over here where you get much lower. The reason this matters is because we didn't know that systems were this pulsy in terms of denitrification. We didn't know that. So here we are again in Narragansett Bay. This is the Providence River estuary up here near the city. And that's going to be this green slide here, the green data here. And this is the mid Narragansett Bay, and this is the red data. This is a really unusual data set. Um, it's un, um, uh, very unlikely to find uh, such a long-term record of sediment denitrification or end fixation record, um, 
uh, measurements. And this summer we went out for my 10th year, which I'm not sure is inspiring to me or depressing, but um, it's still a really awesome data set. And what you can see is this dashed line shows the mean up here in the Providence River where we know there's more um, production because there's more nitrogen there. Um, we have a higher rate of denitrification as opposed to down here in Mid-Narragansett Bay, less production, we have less denitrification. The other interesting thing is that we see that the system's really pulsy. So depending on how much phytoplankton you have depends on whether or not you're going to remove nitrogen via denitrification or add nitrogen to the system via denitrification, for it to via end fixation. We can look at this another way by taking that chlorophyll from the water column and coming up with a model. So here we're looking at water column chlorophyll versus all of the N2 measurements ever made in Narragansett Bay. Um, and this is just summer. These are just summer, and that's because the data weren't available for any other time of year for the chlorophyll. But you can see that there's a relationship here between the amount of chlorophyll you add and the amount of denitrific denitrification that occurs. And if we just look at denitrification and ignore the end fixation, this relationship is really strong. So the more uh, summer chlorophyll you have reaching the bottom, the higher the rate of denitrification. We can use this simple model to go back and predict how much nitrogen cycling has changed in Narragansett Bay over the last um, 40 years or so. And then I got tricky and went back to when Verrazano entered Narragansett Bay. So what is it? What are we looking at here? I'm taking the model that says summer chlorophyll versus how much N2 is removed through denitrification. And I'm applying it to all of the chlor summer chlorophyll numbers we have in Narragansett Bay. You can see there are some summers in the blue here where we have really big modeled predictions of N2 law or removal via um, denitrification. And then we have all of these measured numbers. So there has been certainly, there's been highs and lows throughout the history of the bay. And right now we're in sort of a low period because we have less phytoplankton production overall. The Verrazano thing is really fun. Um, my graduate advisor had written a paper about prehistoric nitrogen inputs to Narragansett Bay. Verrazano was the person who discovered Narragansett Bay. And he'd come up with a chlorophyll number. And so because this was an invited paper I got asked to write, I knew I could get, to get it through reviewers. So um, I decided to predict how much, what was that, whether we had denitrification or end fixation when Verrazano entered the bay. And it looks like maybe we had end fixation. Um, okay, so I know. So this is a, a messy, lovely, wonderful slide that I love. Um, and I love it because it shows all of the different connections between nitrogen and phosphorus and organic matter and CO2 up here. For a long time, when people go to study something, they study one element. Like, I'm just going to look at nitrogen. And I urge you guys, no matter what you're doing, to remember the interconnectedness of what you're looking at. You should be looking at a scale above the problem that you're looking at and look at a scale below. Because to look, doing that way will allow you to kind of zero in on the answer. Um, by changing the, the climate um, in, in and around Narragansett Bay and making it warmer with less sunlight and less wind, we change the organic matter in the system. And by doing that, we ultimately change the amount of nitrogen cycling in Narragansett Bay. And I don't have time to get into it, but I'll tell you now that my lab is getting interested in working with phosphorus because there's some really interesting connections between changing the amount of phosphorus and how much denitrification is removed. Um, so with that, I will say thank you um, to Dave for inviting me to my funding sources, to everyone in my lab um, who I could not do this lab work without, and then lots of people who help us. And if you have questions, I will happily answer them. Thank you.